Hello, my name is Lamar Davis and about a year ago I published a book as an e-book um, and the book is called The Success of Academic Failure. The book is currently uh, can currently be found on Amazon.com. What I would like to do is read you a selection of the book, the introduction, called Walk in My Shoes. I was motivated to write the book as a result of uh, 20 years of experience teaching in the Flint School District. Allow me please to take up your time and to share with you what some of my experience have been and the experiences of other teachers. Exiting my car I am met with the crackling of the snow as I walk step by step toward the school's entrance. It is Monday morning accompanied with a cold chill occupying the air. Peering through the glass doors and opening them I see students walking through the halls, standing, running, leaning against lockers and huddled in groups. Bitch, I'll whoop your ass. Man, your ass is fucked up. And I had your bitch last night reverberates throughout. Two to three students run through the halls chasing one, an one another at full speed. Upon entering my classroom, the same three students that are always on time are present. A couple of others fall in before the tardy bell rings. I observe hundreds of students in the hall as though the tardy bell never sounded. Some are chasing their friends, others still leaning on lockers talking, but most simply standing, not even attempting to move toward their classrooms. What up, my nigga? Ask one student to another. Down the hall, one student loudly proclaims, I don't give a fuck while talking to his friend. One student walks past wearing house shoes while proclaiming loudly, I'm so hood, making reference to claiming that being from the ghetto is something to be proud of, a sort of badge of honor. Badge of honor. A colleague of mine tells a student, to remove his hat. As though the teacher said something wrong, the student responds angrily, I will when I get to my locker, as he continues walking with it on. I began the class by telling students to turn in the previous day's work. It was an assignment they began doing in class and were able to take home to complete. Out of 25 students, eight assignments were turned in and four of them are incomplete. I staple them and move on. While teaching, I am interrupted by thunderous knocking at my door as though several people want to gain entrance. I open it and two students casually enter 20 minutes late. As I proceed to teach, I am again interrupted by several people knocking. Opening the door, I am met with five students lackadaisically walking in, a couple of them I know I saw when I first entered the building. Releasing my students to transition to their next class, I post myself in the hall where the air is filled with the smell of marijuana. One student inquires to another, you going to class? The student retorts, hell no, I ain't going up in that bitch. Me either, man. We out, answers the other, meaning they are not going to class and they are about to exit the building. As students enter my room and take their seats, the tardy bell sounds. I begin the process of teaching. Suddenly, an unidentified student walks in and then walks out laughing while students in the class share in the comedic moment. That is the price a teacher pays for leaving their door open. A tragic display of ignorance and disrespect. In my next class, 
students enter and take their seats while continuing to talk and socialize. While passing the assignment out, one student says, I ain't doing this shit. I then tell the student to leave the class to which he retorts, I don't give a fuck. This is some bullshit. While exiting, slamming the door. I then tell the students to stop talking and go to work. Two students continue talking and I tell them to leave. They both look at me without moving, indicating their refusal to leave and compelling me to attain the assistance of security. They complain to security that I'm mistreating them while they are being escorted from the class. Upon re-entering the class to continue trying to teach, I hear voices screaming loudly in the hall and making other disruptive noises compromising the learning environment. They are singing songs, knocking on the walls, running, wrestling, and cursing repeatedly. Bitch, I'll get you, proclaims one student to the next while they respond, you ain't gonna do shit but get fucked up. In an attempt to maintain an environment conducive for learning, I close my classroom door while witnessing only two or three students doing their work out of 15. I observe one student take a book out and begin beating it instead of doing her work. Excuse me, reading it instead of doing her work. Three others have their heads down on their desk while four didn't even bring their books, papers, and pencils needed to engage the work. One student approaches my desk showing me his work. I discover it is incorrect and inform him on what he failed to do and he responds, so it's wrong? I answer in the affirmative and then he says, this is some bullshit while walking out of class without permission. Another student approaches me, placing his incomplete work on my desk and without saying a word, walks out. At the beginning of the next class, the principal loudly and threateningly announces over the speaker system that any students caught in the hall after the tardy bill will be suspended immediately. He then summons security to engage in hall sweeps in order to catch students skipping. He continues his tyrannical tantrum in the hall, screaming to the top of his lungs verbal threats. Okay, young people, you better move or else it's fi a five-day suspension. And get out of these halls and get to class now or you're going to have to deal with me and I'm not having any foolishness today, he proclaimed. Most students simply continue ignoring him. As I began teaching, a student stacks her books on a table she's sitting in front of and begins slamming her forehead repeatedly against them. Seeing this as a health hazard and class disruption, I pulled the table from her, preventing its continuation. She then takes a chair sitting beside her, shifts it in front of her, and begins slamming her forehead on top of the chair. I take the chair away and tell her to get out. Being a special education student, she is told by her aide present in the classroom to step into the hall. Upon entering the hall, she proceeds to defiantly bang her head against the wall, causing additional disruption in the classroom until the aide pleads with her to take a walk with him. All too often, I have witnessed the aide enabling irresponsible students by providing pencils, paper, and other class materials to them instead of refusing their request in order to get them to learn the lesson of responsibility by bringing these items. The aide has been complicit in that regard and is, in my opinion, the worst sort of teacher. In yet another class, I'm showing part three of a video. Two students enter class 15 minutes late. They missed the first two parts of the video by their absence and a significant portion of part three 
destroying the continuity of the lesson. While some students are writing notes and questions regarding the video, others are simply sitting in their seats doing absolutely nothing. Warning them, I tell them that if they are not doing their work, they will earn a failing grade to which some respond by saying so. Suddenly, someone knocks at my door. Opening it is one of the school's security staff members who asks, Mr. Davis, can you tell me what's up with these two guys? While pointing to three students who were supposed to be present in my class, but weren't. This is the first time I've seen them today. I guess they decided to eat lunch instead of come to class, I responded. The security member then states, okay, I'll take care of this. Escorting the students to the office where I learned they were suspended by one of the principals willing to enforce policy. After the bell rings for students to go to lunch, they are dismissed. While correcting papers in my class, someone knocks at my door. Two of the three students who were just escorted by security and given suspension slips stand before me at the door. Man, why did you get us kicked out? Angrily asked one student. I informed them that they kicked themselves out by skipping in the lunchroom instead of attending class. Deciding that their point of view is meritless, they express some curse phrase as they walk away. While transitioning to the lunchroom, students continue their mayhem in the hall. Hundreds of them are in the lunchroom walking around, sitting, standing, and cursing irrespective of my presence. Suddenly, two students begin fighting. Then, a chair flies through the air accompanied by more chairs, food, and students encouraging the chaos by standing on the tables cheering the procession. Students rush into the hall continuing the fight. When one fight is broken up, another begins, all involving some 15 to 20 students with the rest of the crowd instigating it. This is another scene of mass chaos. While transitioning back to my class, a school security member pulls me over to the side, expressing his anger over the fact that he chased a few students, caught them, and escorted them to the principal's office while being cursed out. The principal is informed by security that the students were skipping in the hall, running and refused to stop at the order given. He is further informed that they were cursing him out while bringing them down. The principal simply told the students demandingly, go to class, rendering his tyrannical tantrum of threats in the hall earlier null and void. The students walked off smirking at the security member. Why should I chase students and suffer every manner of disrespect to only have the principal refuse to enforce school policy as a security member. This question is indicative of the conditions in the building. A fellow colleague knocks at my door and informs me that two days previous, it was determined that a student had a gun in the building. <laughs> Excuse me. And that the principal failed to implement a lockdown. He is in total violation of district policy and has no regard for our safety, and so I just don't understand why he is allowed to remain a principal with each with such little regard for policy, complains my colleague, because he is a friend of the superintendent, making him untouchable, I retort. The bell rings for dismissal, and the day always ends bittersweet. Sweet, because it ends and bitter because tomorrow the situation will continue, more or less. The above is a rendition of what I have experienced during my 20 years of teaching in the Flint Community School District. I began that journey with all the high hopes and optimistic sentiment that most teachers bring to the profession. 
Confront, confronted constantly with principals unwilling to enforce school discipline uh, policy, students refusing to do their work, parents neglecting their parental responsibility, and fear-filled teachers remaining too passive in the face of an aggressively arrogant administration violating their contractual rights, this sentiment was annihilated at its core. Teachers are under tremendous pressure to get students who have no interest in learning to do their work. It is a problem that continues to grow beyond such uh, labels as public, charter, and private schools because it is not per se a school problem as much as a human one. Within this book, I will provide a clear view of the conditions teachers in so-called failing schools deal with on a daily basis. This requires an honest assessment of what the conditions are. It is hoped that the reader will pay particular attention to those elements destroying education so that they can create a better system. This book is an example of what not to do. Chapter 1, The Triumph of Faulty Assumptions, focuses on widely expressed assumptions dominating ideas regarding school improvement efforts. Making up the various foundation Making up the very foundation of school improvement, all too often these assumptions are not even true. It is important to gain not only a clear understanding of what these assumptions are, but to make the necessary changes that can create a foundation rooted in truth and honesty. Chapter 2. Improving Achievement Through Deception recognizes that while many principals, parents, teachers, and students claim to be for improving student academic performance, they often undermine this process. Administrators manipulate the public by presenting themselves as desiring improvements in achievement, but fail to establish the conditions needed to effectively engage the matter. Many become a part of the problem as opposed to the solution. Chapter three, the illusion of educational leadership argues that many principals refuse to take make decisions needed to improve achievement because they fear those above them. Educational leaders seem to be more concerned about creating and maintaining a positive public image, keeping their jobs and enhancing their lucrative lifestyle instead of improving achievement. In so doing, they play a significant role in hindering it. Expecting them to abort their obstructionist behavior is like expecting pigs to sprout, sprout wings and fly. It's not going to happen. Chapter 4. Teachers can promote academic achievement. Distinguishes the actions of those who promote it from those who don't. For the convenience of personal comfort and peace, some teachers make decisions undermining achievement and high expectations. Teachers can do much more to promote achievement in their classrooms without compromising their teaching standards. In fact, they are compelled to do so in the face of teaching successfully failing students. Chapter 5. The success of student failure argues that students play a primary role in determining the level of their academic performance. The public has uh, been inundated with the notion that everyone plays a role in student achievement except the student. If students are going to improve their achievement, they must actively engage their assignments instead of ignoring them. Chapter 6, Parental Ineptitude, focuses on the role parents must play in improving their child's achievement. Unfortunately, many of them don't require nor expect them to do well in school. Some parents are afraid of their children and therefore choose to, to ignore their misbehavior. Using teachers as scapegoats, they, they relieve themselves of the responsibility of confronting the misbehavior to attain the gifts of comfort and peace. Chapter 7, Promoting Achievement through research and development, 
focuses on the need for schools to conduct their own research as opposed to depending on some outside entity to do it. All too often, outside entities have reduced schools to science projects gathering data only they can interpret. Educational leaders, principals, teachers, parents, students, etc. need to engage in their own research and development because they are in the midst of the problem of successful failure. They then should develop theories and policies that relate to their unique situation instead of letting someone who doesn't understand their situation do it. Chapter 8. The Board for Academic Achievement establishes the necessity for creating an academic monitoring system within failing schools, linking students, parents, teachers, and administrators. Within such schools, these individual elements act as individual forces governed by separate agendas and therefore any form of an organized monitoring system dealing directly with successfully consistent failures. Because of this disorganization, there is a real need to streamline what schools are doing by synchronizing decisions designed to encourage students to improve their academic standing while developing and implementing an ongoing monitoring system to verify its continued progress. Chapter 9, Counseling for, for Successful Failures, is concerned with creating a counseling experience for students who are chronic failures. Students will be required to attend group counseling sessions covering numerous topics pertaining to the roots of their failure and success. This is non-existent in many schools consisting of chronic failures, but it could be an approach that can develop the type of thinking students need to become academically successful. Chapter 10, Elements of Achievement, demonstrates the vital role reading, writing, and arithmetic plays in setting the stage for achievement. Unfortunately, many students struggle to read, write, and compute, castrating student achievement and potential to improve it. Often neglected by administrators as an important part of improving achievement, they make it impossible to be improved. Chapter 11, Ramblings of an Angry Teacher, is a culmination of perceptions people have about students compared with the reality. Students are not as innocent regardless of the depth of wishing they were. Some are a danger to classmates, and it may be prudent to create an educational system that can protect the rights of those students who want to learn over those who don't. Contrary to popular opinion, there are many influences in the life of the child affecting their academic achievement outside of just teachers. Administrators all too often ex ignore these extraneous influences outside of their immediate teachers. Chapter 12, Self-Defense for Teachers, addresses the, needs for teach, the need for teachers to engage in activities that protect the inte their integrity and power. It's no secret that they are under an incredible amount of pressure from parents, administrators, students, and politicians, and that their power base, once thought to be their union, is under considerable attack. The forces against them would like nothing but to break them externally by destroying their union or internally by getting them to accept mediocrity from their students so that the numbers of passing students appears to increase. Their destruction will be imminent if they don't defend themselves. A conclusion of sorts ties everything together forming a substantive body of knowledge regarding the education of successful failures. This book is, des is designed to provide an accurate account of what teachers face on a daily basis. Currently, they are under tremendous pressure to teach children who have no interest in learning. No one wants to admit that, but it is true. Politicians, 
lawmakers, lawyers, clergymen, etc., point fingers at teachers, wouldn't dare spend two weeks teaching successful failures. Standing outside, looking in, they don't have a clue regarding the many challenges teachers experience daily teaching students who care more about being a rap star or professional ball player than bringing a pencil to class or passing to the next grade. Many of my colleagues and I have a perspective on things based on our experiences and through this book, I am absolutely determined to tell it. I'm going to make it plain and simple for all to understand, so please, accept my invitation into a world that prestigious think tanks, educational experts, and intellectuals talk about, but are not in the classroom with successful failures. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed the reading. I hope you purchased the book, The Success of Academic Failure by Lamar Allen Davis. You can pick it up at Amazon.com. Thank you for your time.